Conroy, Linda, his wife, and, and Dee Conroy, and family, two sons, have been members of St. Joseph's Parish for over 21 years. Both were on the team, first team of CHIRP over 20 years ago. Deacon Roy was ordained a deacon on June 18, 2011, and, and has been actively involved in prison ministry close to 30 years, and then back in September of 2014, was hired in a diocesan position as the Catholic chaplain and coordinator for death row and confinement at Florida State Prison and Union Correctional Institution. With that being said, I introduce to you my friend Deacon Jason Roy. Yeah. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled, as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Good evening. My name is Deacon Roy. I've been a member of this parish, as he said, for about uh, 22 years. And I am a Catholic where my wife and I came back to the church 22 years ago. We were both baptized, First Communion, confirmed and married in the Catholic Church. But back in 1985, when we were living in Columbus, Georgia, we started to attend the Assemblies of God Church. And I was in the Assemblies for a few years down in West Palm Beach, and up here in Jacksonville. Mother Mary appeared to me in a dream that was affirmed by my sister-in-law the next morning who called me on the phone and asked me the question, who did you see last night? And at that point in time, I realized Mother Mary has called me to come back home to the Catholic faith. I got ordained back in 2011. For 30 years, I've been going to state penitentiaries in Georgia, down in, the, down in the Miami area, and up here in the Jacksonville area. As I was driving to work today down to Rayford, I asked the Lord, what is it that you want me to talk about? Because I could talk for 22 hours about prison ministry, and I know you don't want to hear that. <laughs> My message is pretty simple. As Father mentioned earlier, In the chapter of Matthew 25, he talks about you want to be a sheep or you want to be a goat. I want to be a sheep. I look at that verse, that whole chapter, as two ways. One, as a report card when we get upstairs to heaven. Or two, I look at it as a cheat sheet on how to get into heaven. Now, I'm not asking each and every one of you to come and follow behind my footsteps and go into the prisons. But what I'm asking you to do, as when you leave here tonight, is to reflect on, Lord, where do you want to use me? You may say to yourself, I'm a broken vessel. Well, guess what? So am I. I am a sinner. Now, I'm a big believer. I love NASCAR. And I, on Sundays, once in a while, I do a reflection at Union Correctional institution, I do a Eucharistic service down there for the general population, which the majority of the men down there are the ages of 60, 70, and 80 years old. These are men that are serving life, and now UCI over there has become a retirement home for these elderly inmates, and I do Eucharistic service for them, which is filmed for the guys on death row. So a few weeks ago, I talked about NASCAR. The book of Peter talks about to be in the race as Christians. 
If I went to Daytona and spent big bucks to go watch all the guys sit in the pits for the entire four hours, I would not be happy. And that's what God looks at us. He wants us out on the streets, in the track, on the race, going out there serving him. Now, I'm a big believer. We're all going to sin, correct? Amen. Right. Amen. <laughs> that's where the yellow flags come in. When a car hits the wall or hits another car, deliberately or not, they have to go into the pits to get readjusted, put more fuel in their car, change their tires. That's what church is for. We come here to hear the word and to receive the blessed sacrament, the Lord, to strengthen us throughout the week. What I do on a daily basis is I walk the row. There are 410 men on death row in this state. I go between Florida State Prison and Union Correctional Institution in Rayford. There are five prisons in Rayford. Between these two prisons, there are 1,200 men behind still doors in confined cells, eight by tens. There's close to 600 men behind bars in confined cells. I walk the row every day. The best way I can explain it is I walk in with a full cup of water to share the message, and when I get to my car, guess what? My cup is still full. It's not that I don't feed them the word and bring them the communion and give them listening ears or listening eyes, as I like to call it. The Lord visits me in the prison. Yes, these men have done wrong, and they're there for what they've done. But I walk in with the eyes of Christ. I don't look at their sin. I look at them as human beings. When you hear the stories of how these men were raised, I'm not justifying what they did. They all have a story. I'm currently right now pastoring, spiritually advising 10 men on death row. I'm taking two of them through the catechism that are Protestants that are going to go through the catechism and eventually be baptized and confirmed as Catholics before they get executed. I visit my Catholic brothers with communion, with the, daily, with the word among us. I visit my Protestant brothers with the daily bread. I'll visit my Muslim brothers just by giving them a listening ear. It is a very moving and touching experience, what I experience throughout my days. As I said to an inmate the other week, I am not here for you. I am not here for me. I am here for my Lord. That's what I'm doing. This is not a fun job. It's a very spiritually taxing job. It takes an hour to go down there. So every morning, here's my daily routine. I wake up, I do my office, my daily prayers, my morning prayers. Then my wife and I, we sit together and we go through a litany of prayers. Then on the way down, I-10, 121, I say my rosary. Turn the radio off and I go quiet. I sit in my vehicle and I offer the day up to the Lord. I say to the Lord before I walk into this place, make my eyes your eyes, make my feet your feet, make my hands your hands, make my heart your heart. And I start walking. I've got to go through a litany of about 15 doors, gates, fences in order to get to the first row. There are 18 cells on a row. I'll spend about five hours on a row and get to the next row the next day, then get to the next row the next day. I go to Florida State Prison on every Tuesday and Saturdays, and over there is the confined cells with death row in the death house. The man they were going to execute back on February the 26th, Mr. Correll, I'm seeing now on Tuesday, they put him back on the row because they pulled him out of the death house because he's got to stay. He may be executed this summer. 
But I'm spiritually advising him right now on Tuesdays. He's at peace. He came one on one with the Lord. He's ready to go home. I have a few books here, so I want to kind of explain a little bit about the ministry. Prison ministry does not entail just visiting men inside. When I say men, there's women too. The women prison is in Ocala. There's a man that was a, can I see a few of these books? Who was a serial bank robber who was caught. Now, when men want to get high on drugs or drinking, they get a rush. This man, Ken Cooper, used to get a rush by robbing banks. He started at a young age. That was his high. He enjoyed it. He made money, but then again, he got another rush. Guess what? He ended up finding the Lord at UCI years ago and was released. He put a program together called Prisoners for Christ down here in Jacksonville to help out men that are coming on the outside so they don't end up going back inside to the facility. When I was going through the diaconate program, one of the things I had to do in my third year was come up with a program, and I came up with a program called Silent Tears. I also spiritually advise men in the St. John's County Jail and in the Duval County Jail in confinement. One of the things I noticed is I had a few people within the church, the Catholic Church, come over to me and say, I've got a son that's serving time. This lady, Carol Kent, has got a son serving life in prison. It's called When I Lay My Isaac Down. She put a program designed for mothers and fathers dealing with their children serving time. That's a victim. The family members on the outside. This man here was executed a few years ago in the state of Texas, but he put a book out on how he found the Lord on death row in Texas. The Lord is still in the business of healing people. Now you're probably saying, what about the ones that are the victims? Now how many of you remember the movie Dead Man Walking? It was out a few years, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. Sean Penn actually played the inmate. Susan Saranda played the nun, visiting him on death row. This is called Forgiven, the Dead Man Walking. You remember the female that was in the movie that was the victim? She put a book out. But it took her over eight years to forgive the man that did it to her. It's a powerful book on really learning on how to forgive somebody. We have a merciful God who loves each and every one of us. My words to the guys that are on death row is that even Jesus Christ was on death row. He had to carry his electric chair up the hill and plug it in for you and for me. He loved us that much. And next to him are two other guys on death row. One said yes. The other one said no. And those inspiring words that I'm going to bring you home with me today, I'm bringing you to paradise. He had a repentant heart. I know my family members, not my wife, but some of my brothers and sisters still have a hard time comprehending on what I do on a daily basis. I don't watch the news and I don't listen to the news. I can't do that. I read. I know there's crime going on constantly, especially Jacksonville starting to look like Miami right now when it comes to crime. Those are human beings in cages. There is no air conditioning for any man on death row and in solitary confinement. And just last week, as I walked on the road, within a half an hour, I was soaked. 
the first guy said to me, Welcome to the oven. Get ready for the summertime. And I've walked it in July. It's hot. Most of the men, what they do is they'll take a wet t- they'll take a t-shirt and stick it in their toilet, soak it up, and cover their body in water, and then lie on the concrete floor to keep themselves cool. The men in confinement behind the doors actually have it worse because there's no flow of air. They just got a little window like this, and it's an oven. And those guys go crazy up there. I walk it, and I put my ear up against the crack in the door. That's the only way to communicate to these men is through the crack in the door. I can't not yell through the window. There's 90 cells in a container. When I walk on there, the noise cranks up. Banging on the windows so I can come over and pray with them. I cover myself in prayer. I said, Lord, let me just go peacefully through this. And I'll spend eight hours with 90 guys. And when I walk out of there, I try to, I would like to go to the next one, but the next day I got to go back to go visit the next crew of guys. I got to learn sign language because that's how they communicate through their windows. You've got all these cells staring at each other. So when I hop on, they usually do this saying, it's the Catholic deacon on the row. They call me Chap Roy, they call me Reverend Roy, they call me Deke Roy. I'm out there serving the Lord. I love it. I want to share one thing here, and I know I'm limited with time. How much more time? Uh, Throw your watches away. (laughs) We are in a camp meeting tonight. Three years ago on Ash Wednesday, I was out there at Florida State Prison with Dallas Resinella, who put a book out, Now I Walk Death Row, and now I'm doing the walking, and he's now out there on the circuit trying to abolish death row. I walk into the M-Wing, the doors, and I have a list of my brother Catholics, and I'm going through, and I said, wait a second, where's Mr. So-and-so? He's not in his cell. He's down in the other room. Now, when you do ashes at the doors, I've got to have a guard with me. I kneel down because there's a food flap. And that's where the men stick their head, and I stick my head down there, and I administer the ashes and then give them communion. They have to put their hand out of the flap. I cannot put my hand in because, more likely not, if the guy goes berserk, he could take my wrist and snap it. So I give him communion. That day, I ended up going down to one of the activities room, they call it in the dorm, and there is this man in a restraint chair. Hands behind his back, feet shackled to a chair, and his neck back, and he had a spit mask on. You know what a spit mask is? It's a net with a mask right here. So he said, here's your man. And I walked in there, and I said... Good afternoon. I'm Deacon Roy from the Diocese of St. Augustine. I have ashes and communion. Would you like it? And he shook his head. Two guards came with me, one on the left, one on the right. I administer the ashes and then knelt down to bring him communion, and they removed the flap. Gave him communion, and they put the flap back on his mouth. It was at that moment when I looked him in the eyes that I saw the eyes of Christ staring right back at me. When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. The men on death row, they go, there's one man that's been there since 1968. His name is Freddie O. And there's a young boy up there that's 22 years old. That's just starting his life. 
Four times throughout the years, we have a budget lined up. So these men are given an opportunity to receive cards. I just finished walking Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to 410 cells with the guys on death row with a bucket full of Mother's Day cards for daughters, for sisters, for moms, grandmothers, godmothers, special friends. Each man gets a total of three cards. You want joy? When, you, when I walk on the row and I have a very unique voice, now, when I first started going, they would want to know who walked on the row. You would see that sticking out of their cell, a mirror. They recognize this voice. I've got a very unique voice. So now they know it's me. And I would walk on going, good morning, Hallmark is out here. It's Mother's Day time. Every man gets up, sitting there, standing at the gate. What a joy to know that there's a mom that's going to receive a card from their son or a daughter receiving a card from her father or a grandmother going to receive a card from their grandson. Um, it's pretty emotional. <coughs> Did I mention how many prisons there are in our diocese? No. We're close to 21 prisons in our diocese. They go as far west as Cross City, which is about three hours plus here, to Jasper, to Gainesville. Now, we're very unique in our diocese because we're really fitting in with District 2. There's three districts in the state of Department of Corrections. We are the only diocese that has death row and those two confinement cells. Over or the two, not confinement cells, but the two confined prisons at UCI and FSP. Because over there, between those 1,200 doors, are men from Miami all the way to Pensacola because of their crime or what they've done in other prisons. <coughs> Most of those men are there from other prisons because they've either murdered somebody or attacked a guard or did something pretty hideous to get out of the prison to end up in confinement. Trenton, which is west of Gainesville, is the only youth state prison, and this is where boys from the ages of 20 down to 14 years old are in there for adult crimes. That's one of the worst prisons. It's gang banging constantly. In the state of Florida, there are 45 different gangs in these prisons. I have a list of the rules of the do's and the don'ts for volunteers. I cannot take in my cell phone. So if anyone's ever trying to reach me during the day, can't reach me unless you get a voicemail. <clears throat> Nothing electronic. But I'm going to go through a list of the ABCs of what a prison volunteer experiences. So would you mind if I share that? Well, if you did, I'm still going to read it. So... <laughs> A, alert, attentive to the Holy Spirit. B, brethren, brotherhood. C, now this is a list I put together the other week because Ken Cooper has this list of what an inmate experiences, so I put my list against his. Caring, courteous, and careful. D, dedicated and dignity. E, ecumenical and evangelization. F, faithful and forgiving. G, being gracious and giving. H, helpful. I, be insightful. J, joyful. Kind, listen. Listen with your eyes. When I go to the row, stand up for a second. I get this close to the gate. And I look at you in the eyes and I listen. That's my day right here and I walk to the next guy. And I want to stress that for a second. When you are talking and listening to someone, listen with your eyes. It is so important for somebody to feel wanted and needed. 
The eyes are a really important part because it's the gateway to our soul. Merciful, nice, optimistic, P, polite, prayed up, to be present, to be patient. Q, quiet. My journey on my spiritual journey is I like to spend quiet time alone. Adoration. Best place to be quiet with the Lord. R, relaxed. S, servanthood. T, trustful. U, united as one in Christ. V, to be victorious. W, welcoming. x Can Cooper put being x out? As an inmate, you feel x out. I put in x in. I want to fit right in with them. And the best way to fit in is to be who you are, to be natural. Do not be a fake. Inmates will read you like a dog. They will know the true you. Y, be yourself. And Z, be zealous. Be zealous for the Lord. Spend time in your word. One thing I want to talk about the word. Nowhere in the Bible does it say read the Bible. In the book of Timmy, it says to study the word. I would recommend that each and every one of you, if you're not spending time in the word, do it daily. And I call this the spiritual vitamin. Book of Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. There's 31 days in a month. Except for February. There you can overdose on your vitamins. Spend time in Proverbs. It's a, it's a very powerful book of the Bible. Start there. I could continue on and on and on and share this. But I will close with two things. Actually, three. How many of you have ever taken a Casillo? One. Two. Casillo. If you haven't, I would highly recommend to get involved and do a Casillo week. There you will know about your Catholic faith. And you get to see other men throughout the diocese. Number two, how many of you ever seen the movie Cool Hand Luke? True story. It was about a Florida inmate. And they did have hot boxes. All of that was filmed in California, except for one area was filmed here in Jacksonville. Did you know that? Yep. And the last thing. Here's something I would just recommend to do. The next time you're at a grocery store or at Walmart, look at the tag on the cashier. And if her name is Joanne or it's Mark, whatever, start off by saying, wherever time of day it is, good evening, Joanne. That will shock them. But you know what? You'll personalize someone. They're on the front line of a lot of mean people. So I started that about a year ago. Just call them out by their name. It really makes a person feel needed and wanted. Puts value in someone's life. Just a little tidbit. Just a good Christian advice thing. Because we do it here. Do it over there. That is being a Christian. Thank you. Anybody has any questions? Any questions? No political questions. Yes? Uh, what got you initiated into the prison ministry or issue in the prison? All right. Uh, my wife and I were newlyweds. We went from Atlanta to Macon for a short while. We were driving into Columbus, Georgia. And on the side of the road, there was a sign that said Rutledge State Penitentiary. And I jokingly said to my wife, well, I'll never end up in there. And she'll go, well, I hope I never see you in there. Because I'm committing a crime. So when we were joining this church, she says, you need to get involved. I said, I don't know what to do. They already have a drummer. So we were in Sunday school class. And she overheard two men talking. And one of them said, I need help on Thursday night. Now my wife leaned over and said, really? You just need a guy? What do you? Oh, yeah. I'll bring his Bible? So she leaned over and she said, okay, Thursday night, go to the church at 6 o'clock, bring your Bible. So I showed up at church with my Bible, and the next thing I know, I'm in this guy's truck. Where are we going? He didn't say one word. 
until we turned down this road and I said, whoa, there's only two things down here, the city dump and the prison. He goes, yep. I said, well, I'm not dressed for the dump. He goes, perfect for the prison. <laughs> the moment I walked in there, now back then you didn't need to take all these seminars and classes to get your PIN number and all that. I just signed my life away. The chaplain was there and I just signed away that if anything ever happened to me, the state of Georgia would not be held responsible. The moment I walked in there, I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. And when I came home that night about 10.30, she goes, where have you been? I thought you would have been home by 9. I said, you remember that place a couple weeks ago you said not to go to? That's where I went. So I give all the credit to my wife, being who she was, pushing me into the Lord for letting me be in a place where he's called me to go. Any other questions? What? Did you have your hand up? No. Oh, yes. Not exactly a political question, but during the course of your, your daily visits, do you ever get negative feedback from a prisoner about Catholics, pro-life, why am I here, that type of thing? With the 410 men on death row, a lot of them just waved me on. But I had a man the other day since September, he just wait. he came up to his gate. I call it the gate. He said, hey, I'm Chaplain Roy, I know I wave you want, but I just want you to know one thing. I don't want to talk to anybody, but I really appreciate you coming out here. I said, okay. But the guys behind the doors, nobody, except for one man on the row who believes that we are pagans because we worship statues. And you know what I do with him? Have a blessed day. Sure. Um, no, a lot of guys appreciate it because we're the church that's representing out there. There's very few of them walk the road. Besides myself, maybe there's two other ones. Episcopalians. And I think just one guy that's just a Christian that's been doing it for years. So they all know that I'm a Catholic. But they also know that I'm, I love the Lord. And I'm just out there serving him. So I really don't have, except for one man, and that's it. Every once in a while I pick up a little story or two about a little so-and-so goes there, bishop so-and-so goes there. I, well, on a monthly basis, I have Bishop Schneider, who's 90 years old. Uh, he actually, he's coming out this Wednesday. He comes out once or twice a month with me and a few other volunteers that are Knights of Malta. And the, the men love the bishop. They think he's just right up there with the Pope. I'm telling you, especially the non-Catholic guys, they love Bishop Schneider. Because they always say, hey, when's the bishop coming out here? Um, he'll be out next week. You don't want to see me? Nah, get out of here. No, I'm just joking. But when the bishop does go, I let him alone with the man in front of his cell. So if the man has to go to confession, he goes to confession. I'm based out of the church of McClinney with Father Slavic, who comes out there. He does the masses. Father Slavic also comes out and he does pastorals. I'm doing pastorals. So is Dale. Father, if he needs to have someone needs to go to confession, I'll contact Father and he'll set a time for confession for him. Oh, okay, yes, dear. <laughs> I mentioned this to you before, but I don't know if any of you guys remember, but about three or four years ago, on a Good Friday service, Deacon Roy did the, the homily or sermon, whatever you call it for that particular day, since it's not a mass. But it was all about, it was very powerful, and he did this thing, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And it was a very, very powerful, and when it was over, my wife looked at me, and she just said, wow, like, it was incredible. And he had explained to me the inspiration for that, a while ago, so I wonder if you'd go into that. Okay. How many were there for that homily? All right. I was spiritually advising a man down in St. John's County who was in there for two and a half years before his trial. I actually was seeing two men at the time. So I would do, I would have 
the word among us, and we would go over the next week's reading. And we would do a study. So I said to one of them, Father Cody has asked me to do the homily on Good Friday. I want you to help me put it together. So it was like three weeks before, and this inmate and I sat there working on my homily. I actually had another inmate that was working on homilies too. I got my inspiration from these men. I want you to read this, and I want you to tell me what would have impact on you. And that's when I role-played those five individuals that encountered Christ the day that he died. The day he was executed. And yes, it was a very powerful time, because that inmate, they just would get fired into the Word, and they would, they would do studies. They actually, they wrote it for me. I was just the conduit of just sharing the message. But that's where it came from. Thank you.